Okay. So we're going to talk about uh, Patricia Marino's piece today, which is a direct response to um, both Kant and Nussbaum especially. Her paper is a really good example of how to structure a philosophical argument because she sets up the question of objectification and um, how it kind of the overview and then gets into Nussbaum's um, view in particular and creates a, a summary of Nussbaum's view only with the pieces that are going to be relevant for what she's going to be arguing with. So she does, it's not a comprehensive summary. It's a summary that's directed towards what she's going to argue with. Um, so think about that when you're writing your longer papers. What do I really need to take out of this view so that I can make my own argument? Okay. So she gives Nussbaum the idea that, that she has the standard view. Um, and this will be uh, uh, familiar to you. While objectification can be morally permissible as part of an intimate loving sex, sex between those who care about one another, it is gener generally otherwise morally wrong. This seems important. And this is why pornography, prostitution, and some kinds of casual sex are inherently morally suspect. So I don't know if you got this feeling by the time we were done working with Nussbaum that there, she kind of has an all but marriage view. It sort of seems like she agrees with Kant about sex um, in general being something that um, is, is easy to harm us and that we have to have a robust kind of relationship in order to make it permissible. Um, Okay, Nussbaum's view actually rules out a lot of sex uh, life that we might think is permissible. So compared to Kant, Nussbaum seems to be more liberal uh, about what's permissible, but Marino is going to say she rules out way too much still. Uh, Marino's question, is it really the relationship between the objectifiers or sex partners that makes the objectification permissible, or is autonomy and consent more salient? for moral evaluation. So basically for Nussbaum, the relationship, and maybe she inherits this from Kant, the relationship is what makes this um, sexual objectification permissible. Well, maybe there's uh, something deeper going on. Okay, here's what she pulls out in her summary. <laughs> From Nussbaum's view, the idea that you can use someone primarily as an instrument as long as you do it in the right way. So this is the pillow example where you're paying attention to whether it's comfortable for your partner, but you're instrumentalizing them. You have their tacit consent to do so, um, whatever. Um, what else does she pull out of Nussbaum's view? Benign objectification requires intimacy or a narrative history with the other person. So there has to be some kind of ongoing relationship with them. And then of course, she spends a lot of time arguing for Laurentian objectification at the end. Uh, requires um, use in similar ways. So it's permissible because they use each other in similar ways. So that's symmetry condition. And giving oneself over as an object when the other does so as well. And that's the mutuality um, condition. And um, Patricia Marino is gonna pick these apart and uh, she doesn't, she's not convinced. Let's say. Okay. Um, so the question is again, if we set out um, objectification as this morally problematic um, thing that we do to each other, we have to find out, you know, are there are there conditions that make it permissible? And if these are Nussbaum's conditions, symmetry, mutuality, and intimacy, how do they make that instrumental use better, right? So how do they provide enough change in context to make it okay? Um, her claim, of course, is that instrumental, <laughs> instrumental use can be moral if it's done in an otherwise respectful relationship. Um, and Patricia Marino quotes Alan Sobel here, and I'm gonna call it the temporality objection. 
For how could the fact that A usually treats B with respect on most occasions make it permissible to treat B as a mere means on other occasions? So <laughs> this is the question is, is um, you know, does it make it better to treat someone instrumentally if most of the time we don't do that? Like, um, what would that even look like in other contexts, right? If I, if I, um, can I punch somebody and, and in a respectful relationship, otherwise respectful relationship and say, well, most of the time I don't do that, so it's okay, or um, that's probably too serious of a, uh, of an example, maybe just like a, you could even think of it in terms of like not meeting an obligation. So it's like most of the time I pick you up from school. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know. It's weird. So Marino, what does she say? It isn't that we can treat people as mere means as long as sometimes we don't, but that we should never treat them as means without treating them at the same time as an end in themselves. So um, it's not this idea that most of the time we don't treat them that way. And so that somehow makes it okay. It's that when we do treat them instrumentally, we still have to have respect for their autonomy. And that's what this means, end in themselves. That's the Kantian phrase for still respecting someone's autonomy. Okay. Okay. I'm calling this the re reverse effect objection. Reverse effect. That's not easy to say. What if, this is Marino, what if context of intimacy, symmetry, and mutuality, well, intimacy most specifically, but all of them, can make instrumental use more morally troubling rather than less? Oh, this is a perfect place for italics, I tell ya. Okay, what about when you have an absence of intimacy and symmetry and mutuality? Would it be wrong if I put an ad on Craigslist asking to pay someone to use their lap as a pillow? I don't have any intimacy with this person. I'm not going to let them use my lap as a pillow. And we're not doing it for each other, right? Does it seem okay? Um, and what about the presence of intimacy? What if we actually do have intimacy? Um, she gives the example of the wife who's being used to type her husband's manuscript. And this is where it's sort of like, the wife has other things she'd rather be doing. It's not her favorite thing. The uh, husband is kind of really overly relying on her to do it, uh, whatever. And Marino says, being in a relationship puts complicated demands on the participants. It would be easier to refuse such a request in almost any other context. So actually, it's harder to refuse instrumental use in a context of intimacy. And so this is actually, this is why I call it the reverse, reverse effect objection, is if intimacy is supposed to make it um, easier for us to identify problematic use, it might actually be the opposite. It might actually be that in intimate relationships, um, there's more problematic use because things are less clear because we have such a history of entanglement of desire and exchange and um, whatever. Okay. So in order to make her case, Marino distinguishes two kinds of instrumental use. One is strong instrumental use. So um, <clears throat> A uses B as a genuine tool of A's purposes really as a thing when A fails to consider B's decisions, when A courses B or deceives B or simply forces B to do what A wants. Now there's a lot there. Um, deception can take many forms. Uh, you can think about if you, you know, uh, are telling someone something about yourself that makes them consent to the encounter. Um, that can be problematic. Coercion is, uh, there, there's lots of different kinds of coercion. One is, um, you know, uh, positive uh, coercion, or let's try negative coercion first, which is just sort of threats of violence. Um, 
positive coercion is when you give someone an offer that is almost impossible for them to refuse. So I'll give you a billion dollars or uh, even if you have someone who's, uh, you know, not very well off, a thousand dollars, a few thousand dollars, um, you know, can be really enough to be coercive if that money constitutes a, a substantial change in their life. Um, okay, so strong instrumental use, of course, covers rape and other forms of abuse that we might want it to. Um, then we get into weak instrumental use. So this is a way of sort of siphoning off ways that we can instrumentalize each other and it wouldn't be problematic or not as problematic. We may respect a person's autonomy by respecting their decisions in the appropriate domains while simply not concerning ourselves with their wishes and desires in general. So this is really trying to put a pin in the intimacy um, condition for sexual objectification. So, um, you know, if I'm having casual sex with someone, I need to pay attention, according to Marino, I need to pay attention to their wishes and desires in the sexual domain, but not their wishes, desires in, in life in general completely. Um, at least if I fail to do that, I haven't wronged that person. So what does she think is good about weak instrumental use? It avoids strong instrumental use. It doesn't require that we have intimacy, mutuality, and symmetry. So this allows consensual casual sex, which, um, you know, seems like uh, an account of sexual morality probably should, um, or at least Marino thinks we have strong intuitions that it should. Um, basically, you need to care how they feel about the stuff you're doing to and with them, but not all their life's desires and wishes, and you need to consent and respect autonomy, okay? Which part of Marino's argument is going to be that that's actually a lot clearer when you don't know the person because you have to be, or you should be more above board, more not presuming, and um, you should be able to be more forthright about how you feel about things. That's part of her argument. Okay, so essentially the argument is building to get rid of this intimacy criterion. Um, Nussbaum really does seem to argue that unless we know each other, we're going to just attend to the incidentals, genitals, or fetishize each other, which is fungibility, which is always suspect. Um, Marino, sexual use and consent get even murkier in relationships. There's a complex web of desires and exchanges. So just intimacy alone can't be the criterion. There has to be something more robust that goes across all sexual encounters. And that's going to be autonomy and consent. So then the question becomes, can you consent to weak sexual use? Right? So uh, weak, let's remind ourselves what weak sexual use is or weak instrumental use. Respect a person's autonomy by respecting their decisions in the appropriate domains while simply not concerning ourselves with their wishes and desires in general. So let's see if we can dig out a little bit more about weak instrumental use. This is on 351. The second kind of instrumental use does not involve violations of autonomy. It is the way we treat a person when we do not care about their ends or take their general wishes and desires into account. This seems to be the relevant kind of use in the pillow story. I do ask my lover, may I put my head here, but I do not worry about whether he has some unexpressed desire to go to the kitchen or check his email. I figure if he decides he wants to do that, he'll protest. The difference is subtle but important. We may respect a person's autonomy by respecting their decisions in the appropriate domains while simply not concerning ourselves with their wishes and desires in general. We fail to make their ends our own. If we treat someone in such a way that they further, that they further ends of their own consensually, while we do not concern ourselves with their ends, this is what I call weak instrumental use. So here she talks about, I, I like this example actually. If we decide to drive to work together and split the driving by half, I do not worry about whether you would prefer doing less of the driving or doing no driving at all. This is consistent with respect for autonomy. If I hold, um, 
it's weak instrumental use. So basically we've set up this exchange that we've decided to do and you might prefer not to do it all the time, but we have, we have come up with this, this is a little bit problematic. You have a wish, you have a wish, like you don't like doing it, but it's your choice to do it. It doesn't make it wrong. There, that's what it is. The difference between a choice and a wish. Um, if you mow my lawn because I'm too weak to do so, or just because you're a nice guy and I let you, this is weak instrumental use. If I deceive you or trick you into doing so, this is strong instrumental use. Weak use involves respecting a person's stated permissions while ignoring the full range of their wishes and desires. That's on 352. So that seems really important. So you respect their stated permissions, but you don't have to take into account the full range of their wishes and desires. Okay. All right, so can you consent to that? According to Thomas Maps, if you consent, then you are not being used. So the idea here is that um, use and consent work against each other. So as soon as I consent to something, I'm not being used. Um, but if I'm being used, I'm not consenting to that. So the two kind of travel together. But Marino thinks you can consent to being used uh, in the weak way, not um, in the strong way. So what are some examples that she gives? You might wanna have your autonomy respected, but your wishes ignored, okay? So it's like, I give you permission to treat me in this particular sexual way, and there's going to be things that I find unpleasant about it, but it's according to my stated permission that I wanna have these things happen. Um, you might want to use the other person's, the other person for pleasure. Um, so yeah, so the, the, and that person might want that as well. Um, but of course you need consent. Um, you might consent to use because you want something back from your lover. And so this is the, um, this is the, um, there's a concern in the paper that may, there shouldn't be a time in which sex looks like a contract but marino says well but all contracts do is sort of establish that one person's going to do something understanding that something else is going to happen and that those two things are um logically tied to each other or um dependent upon each other and <clears throat> she says unless you're having like a magical sex where both people have the height of their pleasure at the exact same time, that sexuality does entail often, um, especially if you're considering sex between a wide range of bodies, um, does entail sort of focusing on one person for a while and focusing on the other person for a while and back and forth. Um, and so there is a sort of sense in which I'll do this to you, you do this to me, and we both enjoy, hopefully, as much as possible. Um, okay, so what does she say about this? A uses B in the weakly instrumental way when A generally ignores B's particular desires and wishes and used B to pursue his own ends, but is attentive. This is very important, especially if you think about Canadian law, about how you have to have ongoing affirming consent. Attentive to whether B's consent, both to particular practices and to the use itself, is ongoing. Okay, so... In other words, it's just fine to ignore someone's particular desires and wishes um, insofar as what's happening to them and what you're doing together is, is, is consensual, which means always being attentive to whether that consent is ongoing. Okay, so that's why for Marino, um, 
these other conditions around the context of the relationship aren't going to work, uh, consent and autonomy matter the most. So this means we have to pay attention to power dynamics to make sure consent is genuine and not coerced. So there's scads of literature in this area that talk about how, um, how con consent compromising um, situations of unequal power are. So um, she gives the example of a quid pro quo where you have a boss who wants um, a sexual favor um, for a promotion and um, that would be, you know, a problem because that person, it's an unequal power dynamic. And um, that person's consent has been manipulated, I guess, with the offer of exchange and the fact that that person has power over them to punish them if they don't consent. So that's part of the issue. The other issue is sort of like bigger social and political problems around like whose, um, whose consent is recognized and understood. Um, you know, a lot of feminist protest around um, sexual assault um, has been about talking about yes means yes, no means no. Um, because, you know, for, it has been um, an observed social pattern that um, the many different ways in which people who are less powerful say no to sexual encounters with people more powerful are just not recognized. So their words are not recognized, um, their power is not respected, their autonomy is not respected. And so these muddy, muddy these contexts and um, we should be really worried about that. We're going to talk about um, consent sort of in the next little bit of the course as well. So insofar as society is so organized that some persons must allow themselves to be used or otherwise objectified because they're poor, because they are regarded as non-autonomous, because they're simply regarded as sex objects and therefore always used, there isn't morally acceptable sexual use. So um, when we talk about disability and sex, one, we're going to watch a documentary about a sex worker um, who is, well, uh, she seems to be doing her chosen profession. Um, and so there, we have to acknowledge that there's diversity amongst people who do sex work. Um, and there are other sort of while there are allegiances between both of them in terms of like they're subject to similar laws or whatever, there's a lot of range of differences. So one of the words that gets used here, people who are simply regarded as objects and therefore always used, or people who are regarded as non-autonomous or because they're so poor, um, the term there has been used, uh, the term that's been used there has been uh, survival sex work. So people who have had to let's say resort to sex work um, because it is their only option. Um, uh, and so that's quite different than the woman in the documentary that we're going to be watching. Although, like I said, there's reasons for political lines between them. Um, thus sexism and inequality of various kinds can make sexual use morally problematic because they make consent impossible. Um, okay, so we still have to deal with our social and political context. Absolutely. So Marino's view downplays mutuality, symmetry, and intimacy. Marino has shown that intimate relationships are often even more difficult to adjudicate and that mutuality and symmetry don't make a moral difference. So hopefully this larger conversation about objectification between Kant, Nussbaum, and Marino, and Cahill actually, um, gives you enough of a background here that maybe we can start building a paper out of it. But anyway, that's all for now.